Okay, so uh, we're going to start the review session with just a couple of minutes uh, where you can ask questions about uh, section material, meaning the books from section or anything else from section. I think that each of you had section last week where you were able to go through and review in section the material that was relevant. Uh, you got a review sheet, but I wanted to just give a few minutes here for any last minute questions on that. Are you saying more volume or you love what I'm saying? He's just nodding, so I, I assume he loves what I'm saying. Um, so just a few minutes on that, just to put it in perspective so that we don't get stuck on this one sort of corner of things. Out of the 47 questions on the exam, and yes, there are 47 questions finalized for the exam. I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, there are four questions from section, books, and so on. So it's 10% or less of the exam. It's less. Um, so there are questions on there, but we'll just spend a few minutes on it. So I'm going to hand the microphone over, and if you have questions about section or the books that you read for section, now's the time to ask. Go ahead. Oh, the question is, is that if the um, if there's a question on the exam that refers to a study from the book, uh, the book will be mentioned by name, so you'll know that that's where the study came from. Um, yeah, that it's that it's a method of effective suppression, and and you might want to know when it's effective, under what circumstances, but that it's a, an effective method. I forget to do that, I apologize. Yeah, should do that. Um, the question was, what should we know about remote control? Um, so just know that it's one method of um, suppression, um, and I don't really know what else to say about it. Under what circumstances it's, it's effective. I mean, I think basically when you have um, control over the situation is when you can use that. If you don't have external control, if you can't change the situation, then remote control wouldn't work. We don't have any markers. The question was um, about the rebound effect, but I mean, know the rebound effect. Oh, there you go. Megan's going to do it for you. And I mean, refer to the original white bear study, which is on pages three and four of your book. And the Volkswagen study is relevant for the rebound effect. And that's on page 67, 68, and 69. <laughs> The, I mean, the basic point of the rebound effect is that when you, have, when you have spent time suppressing a thought, when later you're allowed to think about the thought as much as you want, you think about it even more than you would have if you hadn't spent that time suppressing it. So if you just came in and I said, think about white bears as much as you want, um, I believe the book said you would ring the bell on average about 12 times. But then if I say, okay, suppress white bears, and then after doing that I say, think about white bears as much as you want, you ring the bell on average like 18 times or something. So it's even more than you would have in other circumstances. And then there's some, the studies, the Red Volkswagen study is relevant for that because if you have a focused form of self-distraction, which is what they did in the, in the Red Volkswagen, um, then the rebound effect effectively goes away. And Megan drew you a nice graph. It's, small. it's tiny, so you can come up and see it later. So having that focused self-distractor of the red Volkswagen doesn't really help you in the initial condition when you're told to suppress. 
because you're right, you just think of the white bear and then you think of the red Volkswagen and they're just associated. But it buffers you from the rebound effect because I'm not really sure why actually. But once you're allowed to think about the white bear, now you're just thinking of the red Volkswagen and you're not thinking of the red bear. White bear. This room is not air conditioned. Uh, actually, you're sitting under a giant vent. So you can see those fewer people sitting around you. <laughs> and it's not because of anything to do with you for years. I never remember quite where it is, but there's always a spot that people really upset. But look, there's all these extra seats. Yeah, no, there's a, lousy, a couple lousy spots with extra air conditioning. The grass? Oh, wait. Okay, so uh, this graph is really small, but the clear bar is the, <laughs> no, can, any, can you raise your hand if you can see the graphs? Oh, oh, okay, I'll just explain the graph. <laughs> uh, basically, well, if you need to look at the graph, you can just come up after the review and look at it closer. But the point is just that if you were initially suppressing, you're still going to think about the white bear a fair amount, maybe not as much as the people who were always allowed to think about it, but still a fair amount. But then when you're later allowed to talk about the white bear, uh, but you originally suppress, you start thinking about it like crazy, even more than the people who are always allowed to think about it. Not very. How well do you need to know meta language and object language and like conscious experience related to that? And you don't really need to know that very well. So, um, the exam is written. Uh, there are no copies in my garbage can or anything like that for you to go rifling through. Um, the questions are roughly speaking divided up equally among all the lectures with sort of two exceptions. There's two things you need to know about that. One is that there are fewer questions on the lecture I'm going to give tomorrow, because since you're not going to have as much time to take that in, it didn't seem fair to put as much weight on that. So that's relatively less represented on the exam. Um, and then the other thing is section, all the sections together, are essentially equivalent to one lecture in terms of how much they appear on the exam, about one lecture. Bye. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think what else. Um, so, yeah, I think, that, I think that's all that needs to be said. Bring your number two pencil. We'll bring the Scantrons. Uh, leave the cheat sheets at home. I think that's all the basic stuff. Any questions about sort of the structure of the exam or anything like that before we get into taking questions on the content? No? Okay. when the lecturers talk about a lot of past researchers? Do you mean the philosophers? Oh, so they're not researchers, they're philosophers. Um, philosophers have opinions, researchers have data. Um, so yes, the philosophers are the only ones for the entire quarter where you need to know them by name because there's really no other way to reference them. 
And trust me, if I had you referencing them by their theory names, uh, you'd be far more upset about that. So we'll stick to their names. For anyone else, any of the researchers, for the rest of the studies we've talked about, um, their names may help you understand what we're talking about in the question, but they'll never be necessary for answering the question. Roy Baumeister. Wait, say that again slower. Where, where does it say that? That help us learn and grow to exist? Right. So, so what thing are you asking about? Just because I talk about Roy Baumeister a lot in here in different lectures. So just which thing are you asking about? I just couldn't follow what you. OK. So, um, so the idea with the historical view of the self okay, is that the nature of the self has changed over the last 1,000 years, at least in Western civilization. Uh, which is what he's focusing on. So he's not making any claims specifically about the rest of the world, uh, but he's talking about Western civilization where there's been a specific pattern of uh, kind of uh, urbanization, industrialization, uh, religious upheaval, all these things that have changed the nature of the daily events that we face and the kinds of big decisions that we have to cope with in our lives now that we didn't have to a thousand years ago. Okay? Um, and so what he argues is that the self is something we sort of develop as a, as a concept. It's almost like you're writing a book or a story, but you're writing a story about yourself and that is the thing that we keep in our heads that we call ourselves. It's a story or a sketch that we are essentially the author of. And that story is going to look very different if, um, if you never have to actually deal with any difficult decisions. You know, if all your decisions are, are set for you the moment you're born, your story is going to be very boring. Okay? And what he's essentially saying is boring stories with no hard decisions essentially are equivalent to not really having much of a self. And then as you go through the last thousand years, you see more and more hard decisions that everyone has to make. And so people in general develop more and more of this thing, the self. Uh, that was Roy Baumeister. And he's actually a researcher. <laughs> but he was in the philosophy lecture. So you know that was unfair. Yeah. Can you give me a question number so I can look at it? Number 19 on the practice exam. Right. Okay, number 19, many believe that surgeons have poor bedside manner in part because they have been taught to categorize their patients as objects so that they don't have to think about holding people's lives in their hands when they work. Nietzsche would have described this categorization as resulting from, and the answer is B, Apollonian forces. Um, B is, I think, the only reasonable answer there. Elevator logic doesn't have anything to do with that. Uh, we haven't even talked about self-schemas yet. Um, in fact, I don't even know that I still... No, I'll probably talk about that in a few weeks. Um, so it's really then it comes down to Dionysian and Apollonian, which you should know because that's what's associated with Nietzsche. So those are the, the two things that you're going to be deciding from. The Apollonian side of things is all about sort of seeing things in the light and putting lots of categories and boundaries on things, putting everything in its place, putting lots of rules out there in order to keep things 
organized, restrained, and safe. The Dionysian is much more associated with sort of drunkenness, revelry, sort of being lost in the moment. And so in this case, what the, the surgeon is being described as doing is sort of putting on these categorical blinders to only see the person in a very limited way so that they don't have to deal with sort of the full being that is another person. Okay, the question is, what is the camcorder model of seeing the world? Um, the first thing to know is that the camcorder model of seeing the world is wrong. Okay, so I describe it as a model of how most people, most of the time, think perception works, but it is not how perception actually works. So it's a bad model of perception, but a prevalent model. And the idea is, is that we're all like walking camcorders. We record reality as it is. And then if you line up eight camcorders next to each other, they will all record essentially the exact same thing because that's how camcorders work. And so if you line up eight people next to each other, they should all see the same reality because that's how camcorders work. And if you assume we're like camcorders, then we should all see the same reality. And then it turns out that, you know, somebody sees things differently than you and we're shocked and we think negatively, we think there's something wrong with that person who can't see what we see because we know our camcorder works just fine, so yours must be broken or you must have some ulterior motive for why you're not, you know, indicating the reality that, you know, we all can see clearly. Absolutely. So naive realism is essentially an endorsement of the camcorder model of perception. And naive realism is also an insufficient appreciation of the constructive model of perception. Okay, I think you were next. Yep. So I'll, I'll do this at least a few times during the review session. I can go over free will and free won't, but it's not on the exam. So would you still like me to go over it? No. That's what I figured. See, that's what I do when I know something's not on the exam and I don't want to explain it again. Because I know you don't want to hear it if it's not on the exam. There's like two of you who are like, no, I really want to know. You'll come to my office hours sometime. Uh, the exam is definitely, I would say, harder than the practice exam. The questions are the same kinds of questions, um, but I think the exam is harder just from what I know from students in the past saying the exam is harder than the practice exam. So I would take the practice exam as an indication of the kinds of questions we ask. That is, you'll notice on the practice exam we don't say, who said this? Right? So it, it shows you the form of the questions. We like to sort of tell stories, give examples, and say, you know, what theory would apply here? What would you expect to happen if? But I do think, you know, to be completely honest, I think the questions are harder, uh, or at least some of them are harder on the real exam. So. Oh, yeah, I guess I did mention self-schemas in the context of chronic accessibility. But it might be relevant that I couldn't remember that even though I just wrote the exam in the last 24 hours, so. <laughs> See, it's good to come to the review session. Yeah. Number 16, about St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, what might run contrary to St. Thomas Aquinas's tabula rasa theory of the mind? Okay. Um, the presence of instinctual behavior in newborn offspring. Um, so St. Thomas Aquinas basically said, we're born with nothing. So if there's instincts, that's at least something that might run counter to St. Thomas Aquinas' argument that we've got nothing. If you've got instincts, you've got something. It may be part of who you are. Your reflexes and instincts might make you different than someone else. Um, and A and C are clearly not very good answers. 
So capacity to learn through experience is one of the direct implications of St. Thomas Aquinas's tabula rasa idea. Socialization is how I specifically described the implication of that for us. Um, and so B is, is the right answer. Yeah, back there. Uh, sure. So the question was, um, can I explain uh, essentially how you think about automaticity with respect to cognitive load methods? So cognitive load itself is a very simple thing. Um, if somebody asks you to sort of keep in mind an eight-digit number, you're busy rehearsing that number again and again and again, and rehearsing that number is going to interfere with your ability to do some things and not interfere with your ability to do others. So for instance, when you're rehearsing an eight-digit number, it would be very hard to read a book at the same time. Those two things would conflict with each other. They would interfere with each other. And they would interfere with each other because that reading a book is an effortful controlled process. And so if you're rehearsing a number, which is one effortful contro controlled process, and you try to engage in a second effortful controlled process, you get interference. It's called multitasking, and people generally are not very good at it, and they're particularly not good at it when both of the things that you're trying to do involve controlled processing. Now, take another example where you are trying to keep an eight-digit number in mind, okay, and somebody's just flashing colors in front of you. So somebody puts a red square up in front of you, and then a green square up in front of you, and then a blue square up in front of you. Okay? You'll have no trouble seeing the colors of those squares as you're keeping that eight-digit number in mind. And that's because the color, seeing the color of a square doesn't require effort. It happens automatically. So the moral of this story is, if somebody is under cognitive load, Rehearsing an eight-digit number is one way to do that, though not the only way. You can then assess whether some other task is automatic or controlled by seeing how somebody performs that new task when they're under cognitive load. If performing that new task is done just as well under cognitive load as not under cognitive load, then we know that new task is automatic. So seeing colors while you're under cognitive load is not impaired, therefore seeing colors is automatic. However, if you're doing a new task while under cognitive load and you do worse on that task under cognitive load compared to when you're not under cognitive load, as when you're reading a book, people read books better when they're not under cognitive load compared to when they are, then we can say that's not automatic, that's a controlled process. So it's a technique that we can use to look at and, and differentiate automatic from controlled processes that we might want to study. Uh, I remember Tony said that the example of the da-da-da. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, I don't, I don't see what's wrong with B. With what letter? B. B. Yeah. OK, let me read it. Um, number 20, the quick brown fox jumped over the the lazy dog. Now reread the previous sentence. Given the first, the four hypotheses in the first lecture, what does this sentence demonstrate? Uh, so the correct answer is C. Not noticing the extra the, okay, is a result of the way our mind works, but may allow us to better appreciate the writer's intent. That's exactly what I said in class. Um, almost word for word, uh, I said that. Uh, I think the title of the slide was adaptive errors. Um, not noticing the extra the, this is answer B that's being brought up. Not noticing the extra the is a result of the way our mind works and is usually maladaptive in daily life. Um, so I describe situations like this as an instance where it's adaptive, where presumably if somebody typed this sentence, they didn't mean to put in that second the. We all do that all the time. The fact that you then skip over that actually allows you to see what the writer was trying to write. So this is a case where it's clearly an adaptive error, not a maladaptive error, to miss that second the. Is it a maladaptive error because of the equation? But we're not talking about the person who was writing. We're talking about the reading. Okay? Not noticing. Okay? Because I'm talking about you, the reader. Okay? 
But also, we talked at length about exactly this example, right? So I put up this example and talked about how that's an adaptive error. Okay. Elevator logic are all the sort of rules that I come up with, and you can apply it to lots of things. It doesn't have to be about elevators, of course. But any time you're trying to make sense of someone and you're coming up with some kind of hierarchy of rules to make sense of how you're going to categorize people and say, well, if somebody does X, Y, and Z, then I think they're this. But if they do A, B, and C, then I think they're this. Okay? That's all very reflective activity. That's not automatic. That's not pre-reflective. Um, you know, other animals can't do that. Humans are probably the only animals that can do anything like that. And that's not because of our conscious awareness, it's our, uh, uh, due to our ability for reflective processing. The results of automaticity via speeded test. Can you remind me, is that, oh, we didn't, no, 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 we didn't cover that. So I think that was the one, is that the Fazio? No, there were X's on it, right? Yeah, there were like 11 slides in a row that I X'd out. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah, in class, okay. So that's not on the exam. Yep, speeded test, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, OK. So the question was about um, automatic goals, the Chartrand and Barge study. Um, and so let me say two things. One is, at the bottom of that slide, it said something about mystery moods. Don't worry about that. That was an aside. Okay. Um, but the main thing there is that they were replicating a classic memory study in social psychology by Hamilton and others from, I think, 1980. Um, and in that classic study that they were replicating, People were given sentences describing someone's behavior, and they were either told to memorize those sentences, or they were told to form an impression of the person who had performed the behaviors that were described. So in the classic study by Hamilton, you were either given a memorization goal or um, an impression formation goal, and it was an explicit goal. You were told what goal to have, and the memorization folks were told there was going to be a test the non-memorization folks, the folks who were given the impression formation goal, were not told there was going to be a, a, a recall test later on. There was a test later on. And surprisingly, uh, the folks who were given the impression formation goal actually did better on the memory test than the people who were trying to memorize the information. So that's the classic effect. And in uh, Chartrand and Barge's uh, study, they replicated those exact same two cells, just like Hamilton had done it. And then they had two other cells of the design where um, instead of telling people what goal to have, they primed them with words related to memory or words related to impression formation. So they had them, I think, do a sentence unscrambling task. The primes were embedded in that sentence unscrambling task. And the goal was just to see, could you prime people to have a goal without actually telling them to have the goal? And what they found was whether you explicitly gave people a goal like Hamilton originally did, or just primed them to have a goal, which was their new addition, you basically saw the exact same memory effects in the behavior that resulted. Okay. Does that number seven? Number seven on the midterm practice exam. Um, unbeknownst to Karen, most people view her as unattractive, even though Karen herself believes that she is stunningly beautiful. According to self-discrepancy theory, when Karen thinks about her appearance, she will experience A, anxiety, B, sadness, C, joy, D, loneliness, and the answer is C, joy. So what's the question about that? Sure. OK. And when do you experience anxiety? Mm. 
When do you experience anxiety? Okay, so you get anxiety when your real self, what you believe to be true of you, doesn't match your ought self. Okay? You get sadness when your real self doesn't match your ideal self. Okay? What does Karen think about herself? She thinks she's beautiful. So is she matching her ideal? So if she's matching her ideal, she certainly wouldn't have a negative impression. She wouldn't have a negative emotion. Okay, she would have a positive emotion, so then the only real question is whether it's joy or satisfaction, depending on whether she's matching her ideal or her sense of obligation, and uh, satisfaction isn't even one of the choices, so it has to be the one positive emotion that's given here as an answer. And the key thing about this question is, it doesn't matter what other people think. It matters what you believe to be true of yourself. Mm -hmm. Two different what? Uh, I wouldn't worry too much. So the question was about uh, the, the two stories on the bottom of the John Locke slide on memory. Uh, there was a story written by Italo Calvino, another story written by uh, Alan Lightman, and those were asides. Those were not things that I think there are any questions on the exam about, as far as I can remember. Um, so I wouldn't worry about adding those in, but if you're interested in thinking about how those fit in, uh, they are in all the podcasts online, but you don't need to know that for the exam. So the question was, uh, when chronic accessibility and priming are competing, is the story that chronic accessibility wins? Um, and it's more complex than that. So the answer is that it matters when you are looking at the sort of behavior to be affected by either priming or chronic accessibility. So at the moment that you prime someone, and for a little while thereafter, the prime wins. But then a few minutes later, the chronic accessibility is going to win out. So essentially what happens is there's kind of a bump up in the primed construct because you've just primed it. And that prime is activated or more accessible. But then over time, it sort of falls away. And so as it falls away, the chronically accessible construct regains dominance. Essentially, the chronically accessible construct stays right where it always was in terms of its influence, but there's something else, the prime, that temporarily trumps that. But then as that influence goes away, you go back to the chronically accessible construct trumping things. So, yeah. Between introspective thinking and between intuitive, intuitive thinking? Um, I, uh, I'm not really sure. I'm not sure. Uh, introspective thinking is when you are thinking about your reasons for things. Uh, intuitive processing, re intuitive responses, are where you just essentially have a gut feeling about what I'm going to do, but you're not thinking about your reasons for it. What's that? You don't go into details in your mind when you're thinking in in intuitively. Right, intuitively it's just sort of going with the flow of what you feel. Um, so, you know, someone who's engaged in some expert performance, uh, an athlete or um, a musician, when they're doing their performance, at the time that they're now doing it, it's probably an entirely intuitive performance where they're no longer thinking about, now I need to hit this key or now I need to, you know, engage the, the performance in this particular way. They're just doing what intuitively comes to them. In the back, yeah. Nope, behind you, and then you. Should we know all the specific corollaries You should understand the corollaries to the hypotheses. Uh, I will never ask you to say, you know, what's corollary to be. Um, I don't 
remember what corollary 2b is, but if you tell me what corollary 2b is, I could talk for 10 minutes about its significance. Um, so you should understand those because they help make clear why the hypotheses themselves are significant. Um, but you know, think of the hypothesis and the corollaries as one set of arguments that should be understood together. And Don't say intuitive thinking, introspective thinking. No, no, intuitive thinking is not a term. No, intuitive processing. Yeah, thinking is fundamentally reflective. So if you are thinking, you're using reflective consciousness. Intuitive processing is the absence of reflection. So automatic processes are intuitive. Yes, intuitive processes are pre-reflective. Conscious, but not reflectively conscious. Right. Sure. So the question is, number 14 on the midterm, which of the following is not true of automaticity? A, it doesn't require effort. Okay, that's very true. Um, B, it tends to be linguistic. Um, and on the uh, lecture when I put that up there, I said automaticities tend to be perceptual, not linguistic. So that one um, is not true of automaticity. Uh, doesn't require awareness and is often perceptual. These are other right off the slide definitions of automaticity. So right behind you. So the question is, um, when you engage in introspective reasoning, do we do it in order to understand our own position or do we do it in order to be able to explain that position to others? And the answer is both at different times. It sort of depends on what your goals are, but each are things that we might do uh, with introspective thinking. Mm -hmm. So um, for each study that I go over in the lecture, what you should understand is the principle, the concept that's being demonstrated, and what you should be able to do. This is sort of a sign of whether or not you really understand the concept, if you understand the concept, if I described another study that used that concept, you should be able to draw for me, and I won't ask you to do this on the exam exactly, but you should be able to draw for me the bar graph of what the data should look like in that study based on the concept. So you should be able to reconstruct what I showed you in class even if you don't remember it if you understand the concept. So I will never ask you to do that. There's no drawing on the exams. Um, but if you can do that, that's great. But you don't need to remember which bar was higher. You need to understand the concept, which would allow you to reconstruct and figure out which bar should be higher in a graph. Uh, sure. So uh, the question was about hypothesis five. And uh, the two motivations, one of the motivation that's being specifically asked about is the motivation to be accurate, authentic, and consistent. Um, and I think, I mean, we haven't, you know, that's something that'll come up more in the second half of the class. But for right now, that's just sort of, I think, a straightforward assertion. People want to be accurate. People want to be consistent. They want to say the same thing today as yesterday. We don't like it when other people say, you know, that they believe one thing today and then tomorrow they say they believe something completely different. Um, and we want to be authentic. We want to sort of be sort of who we really are and not present ourselves as someone who we're not. We want to see ourselves as authentic. We want other people to see us as authentic. But I haven't really discussed it further because it comes up more in the second half. Hypotheses four and five, we haven't really talked about any of the supporting data for those. Those come up after the midterm. So right behind you. So 
Yeah, so the question was, are subliminal exposure and subliminal priming the same thing? Roughly speaking, for our purposes, yes. So subliminal exposure simply refers to any time you're presenting something to someone um, so quickly, so rapidly, that they don't consciously detect what's been presented to them. And subliminal exposure has been used as a technique to engage in subliminal priming. So I could subliminally expose you to things that don't prime anything. Like I could just show dots subliminally. That wouldn't prime anything. But as long as I'm showing you, you know, words that I want to use to prime some concept, that would be subliminal priming. Mm -hmm. Right. So the, the, the follow-up question is that I said in lecture that these primes can only be used to nudge behavior, sort of nudge the form of behavior, uh, and that's true. You're not going to take someone who doesn't want to go get a drink and get them to suddenly say, I want a Coke or a Pepsi. If they're already going to get a drink, so somebody's getting up and they're deciding to get a drink, they might be influenced in which drink to get by subliminal primes. Um, with the Trivial Pursuit, I think the way to think about it is you can't prime someone to start playing Trivial Pursuit. But if they are going to play Trivial Pursuit, you can affect the way they play it, the performance, maybe something about the energy or intensity that they bring to trying to do well. Uh, but you're not making them play Trivial Pursuit, you're changing the, the form of how they play Trivial Pursuit. So yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the question was about um, the comparison of Sartre's discussion of our object nature, that which can be seen by others, that makes us aware of ourselves as an object that can be seen by others, versus Wickland, who uh, also talks about uh, sort of our objective or object self that we consider when we turn inwards. Uh, I, th I think for our purposes, we're talking about very similar things. Similar enough that I don't think I would ask you to tell me the difference between those. I think Sartre, George Herbert Mead, and Wickland are all talking about very common related ideas. The generalized other what? Yeah, is that what yeah so Mead talks about the generalized other. So the generalized other is a different concept. The generalized other is kind of the voice in our head that we use to think about and evaluate ourselves, that object that is visible to others. We use it to evaluate the things we're going to do and consider how others might view those behaviors. And the voice that we're using is kind of the simulation we have of our parents, of our teachers, of our peers. At least that's, that's Mead's theory of what happens there. Um, so when we reflect on our object nature, kind of the voice we're using to reflect on it and evaluate whether I'm the kind of object who's doing the right things right now. Like, okay, well, you know, I really, I have this exam coming up in a couple of days, but I'm going to go out and party tonight anyway. Okay? And then, like, I walk in front of a mirror, and suddenly I think about myself. And I think, is this what I should really be doing right now? Maybe I should stay in and study. Okay? The part of me that's saying, maybe I should stay in and study, that's the generalized other. Um. Can you say that again? I, I... Okay, somehow words are getting lost. Can you bring that up to me? Yeah. 
Um, right. Corollary 2B is conscious experience is constructed and not always accurate. Okay? Um, right, so that's what subjective construal is all about. Conscious experience is constructed based on our expectations, based on situational influences. Okay? We're not aware of those factors occurring. And okay, our subjective construal of the situation can be mistaken. It can be influenced by some sort of pre-existing expectation or belief that we have that's out of sorts with what's actually going on in the situation. So in the tapping demonstration in class, right, everyone over here experienced, I don't remember if it was here or here, but half the class experienced the tapping, okay, where they actually kind of heard the Star Spangled Banner in their head. Okay? So that was their subjective construal, their experience of what was going on right then. And when they tried to make sense of what was going on for the other students in the class, it's difficult to do because they can't appreciate that they've constructed their own experiential response. So they can't appreciate that the experiential response of somebody else would be very different in that same situation. And therefore, they have what we call an empathy gap. And the empathy gap refers to the fact that it's difficult to appreciate the experience of another person okay, when you're stuck thinking your own experience is just reality. Okay, so in the um, Tim Wilson study where people are thinking about the cartoon and the Monet, okay, at the moment that people choose, everybody's agreeing with what they choose because they're choosing it. Okay? So the people who don't introspect typically choose the Monet. Okay? The people who do introspect are about evenly matched. Half of them choose the Monet, half of them choose the cartoon, but that's very different than the folks who didn't introspect because the ones who didn't introspect almost uniformly choose the Monet. Okay. So at the moment that they choose, everyone would say, yes, I'm choosing the one that I like the best. The problem is, is that the folks who have been introspecting have been tricked into temporarily saying, I like this one the best. There's kind of an illusion going on. And the illusion is, is that they're looking at their list of reasons and they're saying, this must be a good indicator of what I like, because I just wrote these down. I was introspecting, I wrote down these reasons, and when I introspect, that gives me direct access to my own experience. So these reasons here, well, they must be a really good indicator of how I feel. And let's see, I have three reasons why I like the Monet, three reasons why I like the cartoon, so I guess I like them about even. Okay? But they've been tricked because the Monet and the cartoon have been selected for being differentially hard or easy to put into words the thoughts we have about them. Okay. That's right. So accessing the uh, um, right. So accessing those thoughts at the time. Okay. We look at this and we say, "Oh, I must like them about evenly." So I flip a coin. I take the cartoon, or I flip a coin. But the critical thing is, a week later, you call these people up and you say, "So how do you feel about that cartoon you took home?" And they say, "You know, I really wish I had taken the Monet. I don't know what I was thinking at the time." And that's because a week later, they're not thinking about that list of reasons anymore. They're just thinking about their gut response, which is now I'm stuck with this stupid Garfield poster. Right? Um, so at the time that they make the decision, they really believe that they're making the right decision. Okay? It's not like they think, well, I'm making the wrong decision, but I'm going to take it anyway. But they've essentially tricked themselves, and the experimenter has essentially tricked them temporarily. Okay? And the, the moral of the story is, if you're thinking introspectively, you're going to be biased by things other than kind of your real intuitive gut interest. You're going to be biased by things like what is easier to put into words or not. And if something's easy to put into words, you're going to get more things on that side of the list 
than the, the side of the list where it's hard to put things into words. Well, no, no, the answer isn't always just go for your gut feeling. The point of this study is that it's a demonstration that our, gut, that our introspective thoughts are not infallible. Like we have a general belief that if I introspect on my thoughts and my feelings, I will be accurate about what's going on inside of me. That I'm going to reach in and just pull out truth. And I'm going to write down truth on the piece of paper. And so then if I go by what's written on the piece of paper, that's truth. Because I introspected. And so how could that be wrong? And what this study is a demonstration of is that that introspective thought process can be flawed and mistaken. It doesn't mean it's always better to go one way or the other. That's a very different kind of assertion to make. It means you aren't always going to get out accurate information when you introspect. Well, that, that's close. So, um, so in the study that I talked about after the Tim Wilson study, I talked about, um, I think, Norbert Schwartz's study where you had to generate um, 12 or 6 instances when you were either assertive or non-assertive. Okay? So just focus on the assertive part. You can ignore the unassertive part. So you either think of 12 times when you were assertive or 6 times when you were assertive. And ultimately, people come up with the 6 or the 12 that they're asked for, but they pre-tested to sort of find the, the magic number. And the magic number is six because most people can come up with six times that they were assertive. It's hard and effortful to come up with 12. So the problem is that when people come up with 12 instances of being assertive, they mistake the effort that it takes them to come up with those last few examples as an indicator that they must not actually be very assertive. Because if I was assertive, I think it would be easy to come up with endless instances. But the truth is, even assertive people have trouble getting to 12. So here's another case where our feeling about that introspective process leads us to come to a conclusion. I must not be assertive if it was hard for me to come up with 12 examples. But actually, that's just another sort of trick where if you give the right number that people have to come up with, it's hard for everyone. They think they're less assertive. So, yep. Number 23 on the midterm, uh, when, you, when you are aware that you feel sad, you are relying on what form of consciousness? Um, now, I only ever talked about two of these. So two of these don't exist. There is no such thing as observant consciousness or systemic consciousness. Um, so we're comparing reflective consciousness A and stream of consciousness D. So the, the key part of the concept here is that if you were simply feeling sad, we might say that was a stream of consciousness event. But if you are aware that you feel sad, if you are thinking about the fact that you feel sad, that is the essence of a reflective process. You are reflecting on the stream of consciousness experience. Sure. Okay. So the two things were, the first was with, res with respect to the introspection error. Is that why you should always go with your first answer um, that your gut tells you to? No. Um, there, there actually, as far as I know, is no data that actually supports that. That's sort of an urban legend. You should just always go with C is actually the right answer in all cases. Um, no, there's no evidence that supports that, but it's certainly the wisdom behind that incorrect assertion is that there's something important about your gut feeling and when you start second guessing yourself you can just get completely off track and that certainly can happen but there are other times where the, our first answer was the result of a bad intuition or sloppy gut feelings so you know there's no simple answer as I was trying to explain over here we can't say because introspective errors can occur when exactly they do occur, unless you do a very careful experiment like the kind Tim Wilson did. Now, the second thing you asked about was... Right. So non-conscious pre-reflective versus reflective conscious processing. Okay. Um, 
let's see, non-conscious processes are ones that occur, for instance, when you subliminally prime someone. So they're never aware in any way that they've been exposed to some information. We'd say that's a non-conscious process. What follows from that? Okay. Um, Pre-reflective processes, stream of consciousness processes, those are synonyms. Pre-reflective, stream of consciousness. These are the things that are just sort of our bare awareness and immediate experience of the world. Presumably our cats and dogs and, and other pets have pre-reflective consciousness, stream of consciousness. Um, you know, when, when you put you know, a, some leftovers in front of Rover, like you have a steak and you don't finish it, so you put some of the steak down in front of Rover, it tastes delicious to Rover. It, that's experience, that's immediate experience of it. But what you don't get in Rover is Rover saying, I gotta figure out how to get me more of that steak. Okay, that's a reflection on the experience. And that's something that only humans, maybe one or two primates, but maybe not. But humans versus the rest of the animal kingdom, we have reflective consciousness where we can take a chunk of our stream of consciousness, a little bit of what just happened to us, and we can sort of freeze that in our mind and consider it and think about it and think about what do I want to do in the future to get more of that, avoid that, whatever it is, right? We could imagine if one steak was this good, imagine if I got 10 and stacked them up on top of each other, like out of a cartoon or something. That's a, pre, that's a reflective, sorry, reflective conscious act. Our ability to take the stream of consciousness, evaluate it, imagine it in different ways, manipulate it. So those are the differences there, okay, in the back. Okay, so the question was about the prisoner's dilemma experiment, and, um, and I will say two things. Uh, one, the prisoner's dilemma experiment, while I think it's an interesting study in itself, is not important. You don't need to understand the prisoner's dilemma's game. Uh, we're not focusing on behavioral economics, which is where that game comes from. The critical thing to understand the game, the only thing you need to understand about that game, is that there are two ways that you can play it. You can either play it to selfishly maximize the amount of money you personally are going to get, or you can play it in a more cooperative way where you try to emphasize what you and the other person are going to get together. And you might get a little less yourself that way, but the two of you together are going to get a lot more. So there's these two ways you can play the game, and what they showed in that study is that you can prime people to play the game in dramatically different ways by either calling the game the Wall Street game, which primes people to play the game in the selfish way, or the community game, which primes people to play the game in the way where they try to maximize the total amount that the two of them get together. Okay? So the, the point of that is that the situational context, the label given to the game, had a powerful influence over how people played the game. The game was exactly the same in both cases. They just had a different name for the game and they played it in very different ways. And that distinction between whether it was called the label, the Wall Street game or uh, the community game completely trumped any effects of personality. So we tend to think people behave the way they behave because of their personality. And in that study, the dorm advisors had nominated people who they thought would either play the game in the selfish way or in the cooperative way. And those nominations predicted nothing. So the personality factors didn't, in that situation, drive the behavior at all. Instead, the situational context, the label given, seemed to entirely drive the behavior. Okay? But you don't need to understand how the pr pr prisoner's dilemma works. I'm not going to ask you about that. You need to understand how situational pressures influence people's behavior, um, that's the key concept there. Um, sure, so I brought up, the question is about assimilation effects. Um, I won't ask you about that term, but the general concept is, um, I think, easiest to think about in terms of that ABC 12, 13, 14 that I put up on the screen. 
And the idea is you have this ambiguous thing in the middle, right, that could either be a B or a 13, and we assimilate that or kind of bring that into a certain way of understanding what's up there. So if you have that thing in the middle surrounded by letters, we pull that thing into the letter end of what it could be, and that's called assimilation. Okay, so we pull it in to that way of seeing things. That's called assimilation, but I won't ask you anything about the term assimilation. So, in the back. Sorry, I can't hear you. Um, do you want me to just talk about the false consensus effect? Okay. Uh, so the question is about the false consensus effect. Uh, the basic idea of the false consensus effect is uh, that if you ask someone, uh, would they do something, whatever it is, any question, they tend to then think other people are more likely to come down on the same side of the question that they did than people who made the opposite decision. So, um, you know, would you run around campus screaming, Mary had a little lamb for $50? Some people would say yes, some people would say no, but all the people who say yes tend to think most people would say yes, and all the people who say no think most people would say no. So they believe that their view is the consensus position the position that most people would have. That's a consensus. And clearly, these two groups of people can't both be right because they all think that most people agree with them and that's just not mathematically possible. Okay, so we tend to have an overinflated view of how much our position represents the mainstream uh, consensus position. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, I think, therefore I am? Yeah. yeah. So uh, Descartes' most famous statement, cogito ergo sum, um, is Latin for, I think, therefore I am. And his argument was uh, that if you try to imagine that all the things you know about yourself are somehow an illusion, um, you know, that you're in the matrix and it turns out that you've just been like laying in a vat of muck your whole life and everything that you think has been happening hasn't really been happening. It's just a computer telling you um, that you know, this is what you're experiencing. And that actually, that idea from the Matrix is taken right from Descartes. Descartes talked about, in the 1600s, he said, imagine that you're a brain in sort of a vat of goo, and there's kind of just a glass cover, and somebody's basically stimulating the brain in just the right way to create a particular set of experiences. How do you know that you're really walking down the street versus somebody's just prodding and probing your brain in the right way to activate the experience of you walking down the street? And he says, you can't know. You can't know which of those two things is happening. But as you try to doubt everything, what you're left with ultimately is that there's somebody who's doing all this doubting. There's no way to get rid of the doubter. And so he says that's the core basis for saying the self really exists, that I am not just an entire figment of you know, somebody's imagination. Somebody is doing this doubting, therefore I exist. And then he gets sloppy and just says, and since God wouldn't want to trick me, everything else I believe to be true about myself is too. Isn't that this fire insurance stuff for him, so that he didn't get like, burned for a heresy? Right, yeah, so there were all these issues of if you were a philosopher back then, there was a good chance that the church was going to basically call for a jihad on you. And so they used to, yeah, but, but in fairness, I think Descartes actually was a pretty religious guy. So, you know, they were mixed, right? So a lot of these philosophers really had deep religious convictions and they didn't know how to reconcile them. So it was them trying to be consistent themselves and half of them were just trying not to get burned at the stake. So it, it's a mix. It's hard to know which is which. Sure. So uh, the question was about aboutness. Um, I'll, I'll only speak very briefly about this, but the idea is, is that whenever you're engaged in a reflective conscious act, you are thinking about something. Okay? So if you're thinking about the fact that you're sad right now, your, th your thought is about your sadness. 
if you're thinking about the exam you're going to take on Thursday, you're thinking about something that's going to happen in the future. Um, stream of consciousness things aren't necessarily about anything. You can just be when you're sort of stream of consciousness. Mm. Reverse. So Descartes ripped off St. Augustine. St. Augustine said it a thousand years for earlier. But yeah, it's the same exact idea. So St. Augustine basically said, whether I'm asleep or awake, it is I who am one of those, therefore I exist. Um, so he basically said the same thing that Descartes said a thousand years later. Did they see what? The words in parentheses, like no. So in that example, the words that are in parentheses are just for you, this class, to understand the statements and their relation to the primes, the, the primed constructs that are relevant. So no, everything in parentheses in the Donald example are not words that were actually there in the study itself. They're just for you to understand which sentences are relevant to the primes that people were primed with. Um, so they're different things. So the, the, the question was about ego slash resource depletion and thinking about others as controlled processes. So um, I'll start with thinking about others. Anytime you're saying thinking about, you're engaged in controlled processing, reflective consciousness. It's the about stuff that I was just talking about. Okay? Um, so whether you're thinking about somebody else's thoughts or thinking about the exam on Thursday, that's a reflective conscious process. Yes, well, when you're thinking about somebody else's thoughts, that is theory of mind. Okay. Um, the other question was about resource depletion, ego depletion. Those are just two names for the exact same thing. Ego depletion was the original name. It was a lousy name, so people started calling it resource depletion. Uh, and there, the idea is that, you know, long before anyone studied ego depletion, it was commonly understood that if you have people do two consciously controlled processes at the same time, they interfere with each other. You're going to do worse at at least one of those two things, and quite possibly you'll do worse at both. But it was always understood, that cognitive load kind of research was always understood as two things occurring at the same time. Ego depletion basically said, you don't have to have them occur at the same time. You can have one control process followed by a second control process and you'll still get interference because doing that first controlled process tires out your mental muscles that you need for controlled processing. And so if you tire out that muscle, okay, then later when you want to do the second task, your controlled processing muscles are tired and you're just not going to do it as well. If they're both controlled processes, when they're back to back, they will interfere. Yes. What exactly is phenomena and noumena? Um, so these are words that Kant used to try to respond to uh, Hume's assertion that there is no such thing as a self. So Hume, if you'll recall, said there is no such thing as a self because you can't find it. Go look for it. You won't find it. All you're going to find is a bunch of perceptions, a bunch of experiences that you have, but you'll never find the person who's having those experiences. Kant, in responding to this, said, well, but there's lots of things where we only see something like the perceptions and we don't get to see the perceiver. He's, so the, the uh, phenomena are the things that he said are all the things we can see. So anything that you can see in the world, anything that you can directly experience are phenomena. And he said sometimes there's phenomena and behind them are what he called noumena, which are real things that we don't have direct conscious access to. And so the example that I used in class to try to make that difficult to understand concept a little bit clearer is the idea of symptoms and diseases. And that we often 
uh, know a disease by its symptoms alone. Okay, so oftentimes we'll see the symptoms, which are like the phenomena. We don't actually see the disease, which is like the noumena, but we can inf infer that it exists because it would only occur if that pattern of symptoms, sorry, if that pattern of symptoms occurs, if that pattern of phenomena occurs, it implies that there has to be this underlying disease, cause, noumena, even though we can't see it. So, um, yeah. Okay, so the question is about the Jan van Eyck painting and its relation to Baumeister's theory, historical theory of the self. Um, and here the, uh, the argument uh, is that over the course of the last thousand years, if we look at the cultural artifacts, uh, diaries, uh, literature, paintings, that we'll see increasing evidence for sort of self-reflective processing. Uh, people focused on the self, people thinking about themselves. We'll see that more and more as we get closer to current day. And so the point of that painting was just that in all the thousands of years that painting had gone on, no one had ever drawn a painting that had any self-reflective component in it at all until the 1400s you know, when sort of modern civilization is just starting to take off. And so it's just one little piece of data. It's not meant to be the whole story, but it's one piece of anecdotal evidence um, that this isn't the kind of processing you see in our cultural artifacts until the world starts to modernize. In the back. Sure. Um, so empathy gaps are, you know, highly tied to the concept of naive realism. And the idea is that, um, you know, that if you already knew, let's say um, you came to my class again the first day next fall, and so you knew exactly what I was going to do in terms of asking people to give the finger and all of that, it would be very, very difficult for you to appreciate the experience of everyone else in the class because you would have what's called the curse of knowledge. You would have your own perspective, and it would be very difficult for you to get outside that perspective, to appreciate that of others, and so there's a gap between yourself and those others and your ability to empathize, empathize with them. So what's the difference between the generalized other and objective self-awareness? Um, for the most part, objective self-awareness theory was an attempt to make uh, Mead's theory more empirical, to make it something we could study within empirical psychology. Um, so I, I would emphasize the similarities more than the differences, and I think to the extent that there are differences, objective self-awareness would say the generalized other isn't always guiding your behavior, as Mead suggested. Mead said the generalized other is always there influencing you. And I think that uh, Wickland's big insight was, no, it's not always there influencing you. It's only influencing you when you are reflectively self-aware. So if you get someone to think about themselves, that thinking about themselves is essentially bringing the generalized other online, and now you're going to have the influence of your parents, your teacher, whoever else that's kind of part of the generalized other in that conversation when you think about yourself. OSA, objective self-awareness. Mead is just what? I mean, I don't think Mead was ever put on the spot to say it's always there or not, but the inference that I think most people took is that there's this thing and it's always there with you all the time, and Wickland is saying, no, it's there with you when you're reflectively self-aware, and it's definitely not influencing you when you're not objectively self-aware. And I think he's got pretty good data to back that up. Is there any difference between the, the generalized other, Freud's superego, or Schopenhauer's will? So Schopenhauer's will, I think, is the least specific of these. Um, 
You know, so Mead is certainly talking about how kind of the, the world gets in and tells you kind of what are the right things to value in that generalized other. And I think Freud's superego is very similar to that. The will is certainly something that regulates a person, but Schopenhauer is much less clear about you know, what is part of the will. And sorry, I'm getting it wrong. It's not the will, it's the idea. Right? So the will is the other part of stuff. The idea is the stuff for Schopenhauer that's doing the regulating. Um, so certainly the idea for Schopenhauer is closest to the generalized other and superego. It's just less fleshed out. It's in the same ballpark. It's not the same. And I wouldn't ask you, I think, to compare those two directly. Correct? Well, I mean, it was and it wasn't the same thing. So it was the same thing in terms of them talking, roughly speaking, about the same two motivational forces, but they assigned very different values to them in terms of what they thought was kind of the desirable end of the spectrum. So Schopenhauer basically said the only thing of worth is the idea, and the will is just what makes us like other animals. And Nietzsche said that the Apollonian is basically you know, civilization corrupting you into thinking that you value things that you never decided on for yourself and that the Dionysian is kind of the basis for being a real authentic individual. Um. Can you speak up? Sorry, I can't hear you. Can I explain naive realism? So naive realism is the belief, the assertion that we see reality as it is and that if somebody else doesn't see the same reality we do, there must be something wrong with them. They're crazy, mean, stupid, or biased. Because I see reality as it is, and if you were normal, you would see the same reality. It's essentially an endorsement of the camcorder model of perception. Um, and an insufficient appreciation for the constructive model of perception, an in, uh, insufficient appreciation for the notion of subjective construal, and the fact that we each have different subjective construals, which can reasonably lead us to have different perspectives, different uh, perceptions, different experiences. Um, I mean, naive realism doesn't say anything about B, right? So it's very explicitly about A, C, and D, right? So B just doesn't have anything to do with that. It's not consistent or inconsistent. It's just not suggested by the theory. It's just tangential to it. Thought we reached that moment, but no. <laughs> Don't worry about active versus passive emotions. If it made sense in class, fine, it's not on the exam. Sartre? What about Sartre? I, I spent like 20 minutes. On it. Okay. Right, so you can't know, so the question is where does the anxiety component come in for Sartre? And the idea is, is that you can't see yourself the way others see you. Others see you as having a nature in just the same way that you see other people as having a nature. 
but you can't see exactly what they're seeing when, when you behave. And as a result, you can't tell how they're going to judge and evaluate you, whether or not you're going to be safe and liked, or whether or not you're going to be disliked, kicked out of the group, whatever it is. And so that creates a fundamental anxiety over what face am I turning to the world, and it makes me think, what do I need to do to make sure that I am presenting the right face to the world so that I will be safe, so that I will be liked. And so this creates a fundamental anxiety. Right, so the question is, when you're talking about priming, does that sort of only work when you're talking about automatic processes, or will it work for controlled processes as well? Um, and the general assumption is, is that if you can prime something subliminally, it's an automatic process. That that's the kind of thing that can be activated subliminally. Yes? If you're what? So the critical thing about priming is not whether it's subliminal or not, it's whether or not A, it gets into your brain, and B, whether you're aware that someone is trying to prime you. As long as it gets in, and as long as you're not aware that someone's trying to prime you, it should have its automatic effects. So it might get in through a conscious process, but once it gets in, its effects are going to be automatic. Sure. So William James talks about the I and the me. Um, and basically the I, he's basically saying it's the active agent. It's whoever is doing what you're doing, that's the I. So I play sports, I take care of my son, I read books, I wrote your midterm. Okay. That it's the part of the self that's active, doing, and having immediate experiences right now. The me is essentially the story that I've told myself about me. So it's all the things that I believe to be true of me. And a lot of how I figure out what belongs as part of me is that I look at things the I has done and I say, I did X, Y, and Z. And if I did X, Y, and Z, then I must be a nice person. If I did A, B, and C, then I must be um, an athletic person. And when we make those generalizations, those become part of the me. So the I is the active part that's thinking, that's doing, experiencing. The me is the story that we essentially tell ourselves about ourselves. It's the story, not the telling part. That's right. It's, it, the I interprets what it did and stores it as part of the me. So the I is the narrator. The me is what's narrated. It's the book that, that's produced. That's right. Exactly. Okay, we're coming down to the final minutes here. Is the test curved? What was that, groan? Um, yes and no. It's not a traditional curve. So I, I spent time on the first day of class talking about the way the grades work in here. And what will happen is I will take the top 10 scores on the midterm. Well, if the only grade you ever had that mattered was the midterm, the way under the system I do things, the way I would do them is I would take the top 10 scores on the midterm. And to get an A, you would need 90% of the average of those top 10 scores. So if the top 10 scores in the class get 100 right, get all of them right, then you would need 90% to get an A minus. You would need 80% to get a B minus. Okay? If the top 10 students in the class on average get 50% right, okay, then um, to get an A minus you'd need 45% because that's 90% of 50%. You, Uh, 
if everyone cheats together, then everyone... Yeah, no, don't do that. Um, yes, I mean, part of the idea was is that this is a system that introduces a curve without preventing people from getting high grades. So there's, there's literally nothing that prevents every single student from getting an A in the course because everyone can get within 10 points. There's, you know, but if I set a normal curve, I would have to say this percentage of people get A's, this percentage get B's, and it would just be set by me and it wouldn't have anything to do with how well the class did. Um, but that all said, there's nothing based on just the exam itself. I will take all of your scores combined at the end of the quarter and take the top 10 of those based on all the scores combined. So as far as I'm concerned, you don't have a grade on the midterm. You have a score that will contribute to your final total score. And I'll try to give you some guidance on what that score means, but that doesn't mean after everything else that it will mean the same thing at the end of the quarter because it depends on how all the other grades play out as well. Oh, I'll tell you about that after the midterm. Okay, now I think we've reached that breaking point and I have to get home. So I will see you in here tomorrow at 12.30.